Okay, I want to talk about um, the idea of why when you take your calculator and you type in sine of 47, it gives back this number here. Okay, uh, and then we can use that with varying right triangles, no matter how big they are. Uh, in regards to their side lengths. So as I look at this triangle here, what, what I've got going on here um, is that I can change these the parameters, I guess, of this triangle. I can change the uh, side lengths. And when I do the quotient of opposite divided by hypotenuse, I always get 0.731. But I want to talk about why that happens. Um, and, and it has to do with what we talked about in geometry in regards to similarity. If I have this triangle right here, where I've got that side length 7.5 and this one 10.35, and I divide those and get this number here. But if I were to kind of reduce it, so I'm looking at just maybe that triangle right there, okay, I would still have a right angle there, okay, because I want a right triangle. If that segment there is perpendicular down here, and this one's perpendicular, that means that that angle right there is also 43 because of their back to being corresponding. And then ultimately, they both share angle A, so that angle would be congruent in both triangles. So you got the pink triangle being larger, you got the red triangle being smaller, but they all have angle congruencies, meaning that each angle here in this pink one corresponds to a congruent angle in the small red one. So we have what we call angle angle similarity. Okay. If you remember what angle-angle similarity meant, it was just the fact that if I call this point B prime and this one C prime, angle-angle similarity said that B prime to C prime, the length of that segment, divided by B to C, that ratio was equivalent to A to B prime. Divided by A to B. Okay. Uh, so the legs, basically this leg compared to that leg, and then this hypotenuse compared to that hypotenuse, that quotient of each of those should be equivalent. And we could also do one more. We could do um, A to C prime should be the same as A to C. Okay. Now if I look at these, neither of those and even the one I erased, are this quotient right there. Okay, Neither of these are, this is like one, this is, this is B prime, C prime is one segment from a small triangle, and then B, C is a segment from the big triangle. So this is, uh, I'll just write small to big, and this is small to big. And essentially what I want to do is I want either a big to big comparison or a small to small comparison so that I'm looking at the sides of just one triangle, not comparing this side of the small triangle to the side of the big triangle, but can I compare maybe this side of the small triangle to the hypotenuse of the small triangle or this side of the triangle to the hypotenuse of the big triangle. So I'm going to try to do that. So all we've got to do here uh, is a little bit of algebra. And we know that uh, we're allowed to cross multiply these things. So we get BC times A prime B prime should equal, cross multiply these, B prime C prime times A B. So right now, this is a small uh, figure distance from times a big figure distance. And the same thing over here, this is from the, so B C is from the big triangle, and this is from the small triangle. So let's do a little bit of division, and let's try to see if we can get both big values on the same side. So I'll divide this side by AB. Those will cancel. I'll divide this side by AB. So right now I've got BC on the left times A prime B prime divided by AB is equal then to um, just B prime C prime. Now, I still don't like that because this A prime B prime here, it's not right now that quotient. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply. You can divide it as well, but I'm going to multiply by 1 
over a prime b prime to both sides. So when I do that, they cancel here. I'm going to come over here and multiply by 1 over a prime b prime. It puts a prime b prime in the denominator. And now what I'm left with is bc over ab is equal to b prime c prime over a prime b prime. So what we've done is we did cross multiply, and that's illegal. The uh, product of the extremes is equal to the product of the means. We talked about that in geometry. And we should go through some algebra here of dividing both sides by something, multiplying by both sides to something. So this is still true. This is a, uh, a legal argument. And what you're seeing here now is that BC over AB. BC over AB. Well, that BC comes from the big triangle. And AB also comes from the big triangle. So now we're comparing two parts from the same triangle right here. That should equal then, look over here, this part from a small triangle, this leg from a small triangle, compared to the hypotenuse of that small triangle. So these are both from the small triangle. And that's nice because now what we're saying is that this ratio, if I've got a right triangle with a 47 degree angle, this ratio is always the same no matter what the side lengths are. So when I trace or change this with B down to B prime and then C to C prime, and I get maybe that smaller triangle there, even though that these two numbers are different, okay, this all is true so that when I divide this side by that side, it should give me the same quotient that I got when I took that side divided by that side. So that's the idea of why um, we're always getting that 0.731 when I have a 47 degree angle. Same thing happens when I have a 45 degree angle. Okay, now that number is a little bit more um, maybe useful to us because of what we know in uh, special right triangles. Okay, we've known in special right triangles that if this is um, like 1 and that is 1, then this would equal 1 times radical 2. And if I look at um, comparing opposite, so 1 over radical 2. If I rationalize this, so I'm comparing opposite over hypotenuse. I get radical 2 over 2 when I rationalize this. This radical 2 is approximately 1.4 something divided by 2. If I divide that out, it gives me that number right there. Okay. Um, so every single right triangle that has that, these sides are always going to be in a radical 2 relationship to one another. Okay. Um, and then that happens with a lot of these angles. So we, we've, we've spent a lot of time in, in geometry talking about uh, this being in, 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 in radical 2. Okay, so if I took 5.981 and multiply by radical 2, it gives you that distance right there. Uh, we've talked in this uh, context before about a 30 degree angle. So this would be um, in this would be 2 in. So take that number and double it. Do you get that? And if we were to find out what that one is, it's going to be whatever this number was times radical 3. But we see here, if I go opposite over hypotenuse, opposite, which would be n divided by 2 in, that's n over 2 in, which is 1 half. Um, and that then happens regardless of which trig ratio I'm using. Okay, adjacent over hypotenuse, so this is cosine. Um, so that would be using, uh, let's see here, those red distances. And I can go through the algebra to show why um, I should always be getting CA over BA. You know, always compare this adjacent side to the hypotenuse and still get 0.866 no matter what triangle I'm in, as long as it's the right triangle and I have a 30 degree angle in it. And it's all, all, uh, back to angle-angle similarity and the proportions that are created with angle-angle similarity. That understanding, I think, is very beneficial to us uh, in regards to these numbers. I, I, what I want to make sure we understand is that when I type in, you know, sine of, you know, 30 degrees, why do I get 0.5 back? Or when I get sine of 65 degrees, why do I get that ratio back? And it's because of that similarity. Okay. Uh, so that's going to help us a little bit, I think, in this section 5.3. So 5.3, all 
All right, starting with these trig functions. So let theta be an angle with standard position. So we're talking about this data here. We're saying let P be some point X comma Y. It says if R is X squared plus Y squared under the square root. So R is length, and think about all this is doing. If I were square both sides, this would be R squared is equal to X squared plus Y squared. So hopefully you see it, they're just using the Pythagorean theorem. If I can find that distance right there using the Pythagorean theorem of X and Y, which is essentially the coordinates of point P, then I can come up with sine, cosine, tangent being labeled or defined through the use of just X, Y, and R. Okay. Okay, I apologize. I had to go do some baby stuff, so I forget kind of where I was. Um, but we'll start here talking about this definition of a trig function. It says let theta be an angle of center position. I let P, X, and Y be a point on the terminal side. Uh, and what happens is it doesn't really matter where P is. It could be there, it could be there, it could be there. It doesn't matter because every time that that happens, obviously it's going to have an X and comma, X comma Y. So maybe I call it just one uh, X one y one this one maybe x2 y2 but each time I do that you can see you know using uh, maybe I'll call it p prime uh, you're gonna get that little right triangle and then that's gonna be x 2s distance and that'll be y2 distance and you can find r um, if let it be here okay so we have that little right triangle then this would be x1 this would be y1 uh, then you can find r using that uh, and then I obviously, uh, in this picture, uh, if this was x and that was y, you can find r. Uh, but ultimately, the sine, cosine, and tangent, based off the explanation at the beginning, no matter which one of these little right triangles you talk about, whether it be that one, that one, whatever, at this point, it'll be defined by some point. These right triangles are all similar, so their sine, cosine, tangent um, ratios are going to be equivalent. Okay. Um, so what we see here is that when I talk about sine, so if this is this point is determined by x comma y, the sine is y, that coordinate, over your r, which is your hypotenuse, which is, can, can be found. If I know that point right there, x, y, I automatically know what r is through um, the Pythagorean theorem. So with just this ordered pair, I automatically know what the sine of theta is always going to be. Um, when... I want cosine. I'm going to know what this x value is because it's that coordinate right there. Okay, and I'll know what r is. So I know cosine is x of r. If you think about it, x is just still the adjacent side. It's adjacent. This is still opposite. And this is still hypotenuse. It's just kind of a way of redefining those objects. Um, the tangent, obviously, is y over x. Now, we can't let x be 0 because that would be division by 0. Uh, and that's a problem. We still won't have a way to talk about that. Um, but we'll, we'll get to that eventually. Um, and then cosecant, obviously, is a reciprocal of sine. Secant is a reciprocal of cosine. And cotangent is a reciprocal of tangent. Um, now we see here that because there's division, uh, obviously our y value cannot be 0, x cannot be 0, and y cannot be 0 here. Up here, we see that we still have division, but we never say r cannot be 0. Uh, because if we have a point x, comma y, r will never be 0 because of the, the way we've defined it to be... Um, by the quadratic, or not the quadratic, the Pythagorean theorem here. All right, so they'll ask us to uh, find functions, evaluate trigonometric like functions at any angle. The first thing we want to do is know that in the first quadrant, your sine, cosine, tangent, and the reciprocals, they're all going to be positive because no matter what I do through these divisions, okay, that's a positive number. That's a positive number. That is always positive, okay, because they distance. Um, and when, when I take any of those and divide by any one of positive, divide by positive, always will be positive, okay? Now, if I'm in the second quadrant, okay, so think about this. In the second quadrant, so our terminating ray would be maybe um, something like this. So now that point right there would have a negative x value and a positive y value. Well, then neg that's negative x, and that's positive y. R, you know, square that, that'll be positive. Square that, that'd be positive. Uh, add those together, take square root. R is always going to be positive. No matter where it's at, R is going to be positive because of 
that that rule there. Okay, when I take x, no matter what it be, positive or negative, when I square it, that term right there, x squared will be positive. That term will be positive as well. So then the square root of a positive plus positive is always positive. So r is always positive. But now if I start doing the division, okay, if I look at um, in, in this right triangle, if I go opposite over hypotenuse, so sine will be positive, and that's what we're seeing here with this word sine here. If I go cosine, cosine would be adjacent over hypotenuse, and a negative divided by positive would be a negative. Okay, so in the second quadrant, okay, cosine is negative. Uh, if I did tangent, opposite over adjacent, so y over negative x, well, positive divided by a negative would be negative, so the tangent in the second quadrant is negative. And then secant is just a reciprocal of cosine, so it would be um, a positive divided by a negative, so that's still negative, and same thing for cotangent. Okay. Uh, if I go into, say, the third quadrant, let's see here. So that point P would be negative X, negative Y. So that's negative Y, that's negative X. R would be positive. And if I do sine, the opposite over hypotenuse, so sine opposite over hypotenuse would be negative. If I do adjacent over hypotenuse, negative divided by positive would be negative. So um, so let's see here, third quadrant. I'm sorry, we're in third quadrant. So sine was negative. Uh, cosine would be negative. Their reciprocals are also negative. Okay. But if I do tangent, I'd add opposite, which would be negative y, over adjacent, which would be negative x, so negative y divided by negative x, which would be y over x, which is a positive number. So we've seen here tangent is positive in the third quadrant, and so is its reciprocal. So this is just kind of a, a mnemonic device uh, that allows you to remember which trig functions are positive and negative inside the um, coordinate plane. Okay. Uh, now, the way I remember it is because the x and y axes make a plus sign, this mnemonic device allows me to remember which ones are positive. So they're all positive here. Sine is the only one positive here. Tangent is the only one that's positive here. Cosine is the only one that's positive here. And then the reciprocals follow the same behaviors. Um, so that's going to be useful as we work through some stuff here uh, to allow us to know, you know when I type in, let's see here, uh, sine of 135. Okay, so 135 is going to put me in the second quadrant. When I do that, it should be a positive number back. Okay, now if I do cosine of 135, cosine should be negative in the second quadrant, so I should get a negative number back here, and that's where I get that back. Okay, so uh, that's how the calculator knows uh, ultimately a plus or a minus aspect. All right. All right, so what they ask us to do is to find, you know, cosine 135. This is just taking our calculator and evaluating it. Okay, that's all these examples are getting at right here. I'll show you a better way, especially with that 135, um, to get a more precise answer. If you look at that, hopefully maybe you recognize that's negative radical 2 over 2 as an exact value. Uh, tangent of 390. Okay, so uh, 390 would be, so there's 360, so there's 30. Okay, so that whole blue angle from there all the way there would be 390 degrees. Um, and 390 degrees, we've talked about this before, is coterminal with 30 degrees. So this is a special right triangle. That's 30, 60, and 90. Okay, And in any special right triangle, that's a 30, 60, 90, no matter how big the sides are. So regardless of that point, x comma y, no matter what it is, if that's a 30 degree angle, 60 degree angle, this distance here across from 30 uh, is n, your hypotenuse is 2n, and this would be n radical 3. So when they ask me what is the tangent, tangent is opposite over adjacent, so I have n over n radical 3. Well, that's going to give me, eventually when I rationalize, radical 3 over 3. So when I type in on the calculator tangent of 390, it gives me that number back right there. If I were to type in radical 3 divided by 3, it's the same number. Okay. Um, you know, doing the cosine of 135 one. So 135 would be right here. 
Okay. Now the right triangle that I'd be looking. So this is this is the angle of 135 degrees. That point P would be about right there. I draw my right triangle here. Okay. Uh, would you guys? Hopefully you would all agree that'd be 45 degrees right there um, to get down to 180. So if that's 45, then this is N. That's N. This is N radical two. So my ordered pair, so this could be, you know, this point could be 3, 3, could be 4, 4, 5, 5, whatever, because those two numbers have to be the same in the special right triangle. That's a 45, 45, 90. And then this is by the Pythagorean theorem and radical 2. So if I find the cosine, cosine would be adjacent in divided by the hypotenuse in radical 2. Now this in here, I didn't write it down, but that should be negative because we're in the second quadrant. Okay, so going from here to that point P. Um, I would move left first, so it's a negative direction, and then up would be a positive direction. If I look at this, so adjacent divided by hypotenuse, if I simplify to get negative 1 over radical 2, which that rationalizes the negative radical 2 over 2. So if I type in cosine of 135, you see that I do get negative 0 0.707 here, but negative square root of 2 divided by 2 gives me the exact same result. Uh, so that's kind of what they're getting at here is can you determine um, these tri trigonometric values based on um, what quadrant you're in. And a lot of times they're going to give you, at least right now, measurements that are consistent with 45, 30, 60, and 90 um, because of how we, we understand those uh, with special right triangles. All right, so what's going to help you in that process is in doing that quickly is to determine what a reference angle is. Okay, uh, if you think about what reference means just in everyday language, if I'm if I'm in the reference section of the library, it means I'm in like the encyclopedias, the uh, atlases, all that kind of stuff because I'm going to look something up. Okay, I'm going to use a resource to tell me something about. Um, some concepts. So I'm going to use an encyclopedia to maybe tell me something about Abraham Lincoln or something like that. Okay, so I'm going to use it to reference information. Okay, so that's kind of the idea here. Um, a reference angle, we call it theta bar. Okay, so theta is the angle we're interested in. So in that last example with the cosine of 135, the 135 is theta. Okay, now the angle that I used to tell me what this amount was, was actually a 45 degree angle if we go back up to that picture. Okay, so kind of the picture looked like this, I drew out the 135, and then I drew down this right triangle, and I made that as a 45 degree angle right there. That little 45 degree angle is this theta bar that they're talking about, it's the reference angle. Okay, the reference angle is always the acute angle created from the terminal ray and the x-axis, okay? Um, so here is the angle created by the terminal ray and my x-axis, okay? Um, so those are the things. So theta is the angle that we're being asked about. Theta bar is the angle that we're going to use. That we're going to know information about theta bar to help, to help us tell something about um, theta. Um, one of the, it, it's it's actually really simple. We're in the first quadrant. Theta and theta bar are the same thing. Uh, that's so simple that some people mess that up quite a bit. Uh, so just remember that in the first quadrant, they are you really don't have a reference angle. It is itself. Okay. Um, so here's an example where you know theta might have been 135 degrees, and then the angle that I'm really going to use to give me information about 135 is that angle right there. So I create that right triangle. So that angle right there that I colored in is your reference angle. We call that theta bar. In the third quadrant, okay, we go from the terminal ray and we go up to the positive x-axis. Okay, um, and now that will be uh, theta bar. You can kind of think about the way maybe you could do this algebraically. So um, obviously, you know, if this is uh, first quadrant, theta is the same thing as theta bar, but in the second quadrant, theta bar is actually going to be equal to 180 degrees minus theta if we're working in degrees. We can do this in radians as well. Okay, so if I was in radians, it would actually be pi minus theta.
Okay. And that will give me um, that angle. So an example would be, you know, 180 degrees minus 135. Did that give me the 45 that we talked about previously? If I'm in the third quadrant, okay, the third quadrant, it's going to be a little bit different. So theta bar in the third quadrant is going to be your theta minus 180 or theta minus pi. Because now that, let's say this is 210 degrees. So let's say that theta is 210. Then this little, this little angle right here to get back up to the uh, x-axis, that angle would be 30 degrees. So 210 minus 180 would equal that 30. And then if I'm in the fourth quadrant, okay, so here is um, that triangle. There's the reference angle that I'm interested in. And now find that reference angle. So let's say that this is... Um, and I'll say 330 degrees. So theta is 330 degrees. Then that angle there is going to be 30. And the way that I can get that is to take 360 minus theta. And that will give me my theta bar, my reference angle. Or if I'm in radians, it'd be 2 pi minus theta. I generally don't know these formulas or use these very often. I just kind of look at the picture and say, okay, how far, how many more degrees or radians do I have to take my terminal ray and get it to become the either the negative x-axis or the positive x-axis and that will be my reference angle. So kind of like this here if uh, let's see here real quick so the leg Point vertex, okay, so there, there, we'll go A. All right, so if I'm looking at this vector there, we'll call it blue, that blue vector. Okay. So I've, I've traced that right now a 149.5 degree angle. Let's make that 149. Good enough. Okay. So now the question is, well, how many degrees how many degrees do you need to keep rotating that blue vector that way, or that side of that angle? How many more degrees do you have to rotate it to make it the, make that blue um, vector, that terminal row will become that dotted one right there, and that would be um, 31 more degrees. So my reference angle then will be 31 degrees. So I want to ask myself, what is um, essentially that angle there that will get me to uh, put that terminal ray back on the x-axis, and in that case that would be, like I said, 31 degrees in that situation. Um, if we're looking at, so something like that, now 218 degrees, now the shortest distance, the shortest angle to get back to the x-axis would actually be going that direction, okay? So if I was at 218 and I wanted to get back up there, I would take 218 minus 180, and that should give me that uh, 38 degrees then that I need to do that with, okay? So we're always trying to get back up to the x-axis. Uh, so what you're going to see a lot of times um, when we're dealing with, let's stop tracing this. When we're dealing with this type of stuff and finding reference angles, uh, you're going to find that you're going to be drawing inside your pictures like a triangle like this, or you might get a triangle like that, or like that. You're always creating a triangle uh, in which um, <clears throat> you're drawing from kind of the tip of that, that vector or that side down to the x-axis or up to the x-axis. You never, ever, ever draw over to the y-axis. All right, so how does that help us here when we're, we're asked questions like this? Okay, so it says find reference angles for theta, okay? I'm going to do this one first. I think that one's a little bit easier because we're maybe more accustomed to um, angle measurements. So when I look at theta being 870, all right, so the question is, what is my reference angle? So there would be 360 degrees. 
there's 720 degrees. Okay, so I need another 150 to get to 870. So that's 870 degrees traced out basically that vector there. All right, so if we were looking at uh, maybe a little bit more defined way of doing this, a little better picture, uh, let's get this thing to go to 900. Increments of 10. All right, so we'd be starting back here at zero, so I'm going around one time, so it would be 360 to there, and there would be another 360, so 720, so now I'm going to go try to figure this thing out to 860, so 860 would be right there. So now, the question is, if I draw that right triangle, how big is that angle right there? Okay. Well, right now, you see that we've got 140 degrees laid out. So where did that 140 come from? The 140 comes from this idea. 870 is coterminal. If I take 360 away, okay, so that's going to give me 870 minus 360 minus another 360. So that would be minus 720. I guess I went to 8. I'm sorry. My apologies. I went in this to 860. I wanted to go 870. All right, so you see a 150 there instead. So I took 870 minus 360 minus 360, and that gives me 150. So remember what we talked about uh, in 5.1, that 870 degrees is coterminal with 150. That's kind of a pain in the butt to deal with. 150 a little bit easier to deal with, and the nice thing is that everything that I know about 150 degrees would be identical to everything I need to know about 870. So when they give you these angles of theta that are bigger than 360 degrees or bigger than 2 pi, first want to reduce them down to um, a number between 0 and 360. Okay. So in this case, or a number between 0 and 2 pi. So in this case, I'm going to remove 360 two times and I get 150 degrees. Now I'm going to lay that picture out. So here's my initial ray. My terminating ray would be there, so this would be theta. Okay, so theta is 150 degrees. Now, I don't know much about theta, but what I do know a lot about is that angle right there. Because if I think about that, that blue angle is what we call theta bar. If that's 150, how many degrees do you need to take that ray right there to allow it to become the negative x-axis? you need to rotate that another 30 degrees. So theta bar would be 30 degrees. 30 degrees, then, is your reference angle. Okay? Um, and then that's going to become very, very important as we uh, continue to work through uh, some of the other ideas in this, this course is, obviously, the 870 was a pain in the butt to work with. I don't want to work with that one. 150 is better. Okay? But still, because 150 is bigger than 90, I still don't want to work with 150. I want to work with 30. 30 tells me everything I need to know about 150. tells me everything I need to know about 870. Okay. Now, because theta was terminating in the second quadrant, sine is going to be the only function that is positive over here. Everything else is going to be negative. Okay. Um, so as we, as we work through a couple of these other examples down here on the bottom, I'll, I'll show you how this all kind of... Uh, plays out and, and is used to, to evaluate trig functions. If I'm looking for a reference angle of 5 pi over 3, okay, so theta is 5 pi over 3, what I like to do is remind myself that 2 pi is one complete revolution. So 2 pi is equivalent to 6 pi over 3. Now the reason I write it that way is because I want to make sure that I've got the right denominator here to, to make my arguments, to know how how far I've actually moved around um, kind of the origin here with my, my terminating ray. So here's my initial ray. Okay. So if I were to get to here, okay, so that angle right there, that would be 3 pi over 3, or just pi. Okay. So I've got to go a little bit further. So if I go, so that would be 3 pi over 3. This would be 6 pi over 3. Okay. Uh, and just a little bit of fraction work, if that's 3 pi over 3, 
this, and that would be 6 pi over 3. Halfway between there, this would be like 4.5 pi over 3. Okay, uh, so 5 pi over 3, 5 pi over 3 is going to get me to have a terminating ray. Let's just redraw this whole picture. Okay, 5 pi over 3 is a terminating ray. It's going to be in the fourth quadrant. It would be about right there. That would be my terminating ray. So that blue angle traced out there would be 5 pi over 3. Okay, I'll show you an alternative way of doing this that might make things a little bit simpler for you. That's the case, then my reference angle, draw that line up there, my reference angle is how many, how much do you have to take that ray, that terminating ray, and rotate it so that it becomes the positive x-axis, okay? Well, if this stopped at 5 pi over 3, and all the way one complete revolution is 6 pi over 3, then my hopes are you can recognize that this angle right here, that span, would be pi over 3. So the theta bar is going to be pi over 3, because that's what I need to get back up to 2 pi. Now what would be maybe easier right now is to realize, well, 5 pi over 3, if I change that to degrees, okay, so do this, so that's going to give me, what, 6, um, and so out, so I get what? Five times six is or sixty would be three hundred. Okay, so five pi over three is equivalent to three hundred degrees, just using that conversion factor. So then, if I were to trace out three hundred degrees, hopefully we could all agree that that theta would be three hundred degrees. So what? This red angle here that we call theta bar or a reference angle, does it make sense that that has to be 60 degrees? Okay. Now, here's the only thing that would happen is if they asked me to find a reference angle and they give me theta in radians, then they want theta bar in radians as well. So what I would do is take that 60 degrees and multiply it by pi over 180. And we see, okay, so that's going to go in three times. We get pi over 3 as our theta bar. Okay, so that might be a benefit of being able to convert back and forth between radians and degrees quickly. All right, so where is this useful? Or what is it useful? All right, it says to find the values of trigonometric functions for any angle theta, we use the following steps. First, find the reference angle theta associated with the angle theta. Or sorry, find the reference angle theta bar associated with the angle theta. Determine the sign of the trigonometric function of theta by noting the quadrant in which it lies in. So that's taking the all students take calculus concept in the quadrant plans. The step two there is... This, using this picture uh, appropriately, appropriately and uh, this information that comes from that picture. And then the last part says the value of the treatment function of theta is the same except possibly for sine as the value of the treatment function of theta bar. Okay, So what we're saying there is that everything that you know about theta bar is exactly the same for theta that you're interested in. So we'll do an example here. It says find sine uh, of 240. Okay. So 240, so that would be 180 degrees right there. So 240 maybe looks something like that. So that's theta. Theta is 240 degrees. Now, what we're interested in theta is theta bar right now. So theta bar would be the angle that I need to take that thing back up to get to 180. Okay, so hopefully we can do that subtraction, and we see that theta bar would be 60 degrees. Now, the argument is everything that I know about a 60-degree angle is going to be the same for a 240-degree angle, okay, except for the plus or minus aspect of it, okay. So, when they ask me the sine of 240, I know all students take calculus, and that's telling me what, what trig functions are positive in those quadrants. So, tangent is the only one that's positive in the third quadrant. So, I know right now that my answer to this question is going to be negative because sine in the third quadrant is negative okay, based off of this new mnemonic device. Okay, so now let's think about what we know about a 60 degree triangle or a, a special right triangle has a 60 degree angle in it. If that's 60 degrees, okay, and we know that this would be in 
This would be n radical 3, and this would be 2n. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so I would have n radical 3 over 2n, which reduces to negative radical 3 over 2 in this case. Okay, so the sine of 240 ends up being negative radical 3 over 2. Okay, so let's kind of use our calculator to see if that all makes sense. If I were to just type in sine of 240, make sure I'm in the right mode here. I think I turned off, so sometimes it goes back to radians, so it's in degrees. So that's what I want, 240, because that's a degree. Okay, so that's what tells me what mode I need to be in. And I get that number right there. Well, if I take negative square root of 3 over 2, I get the same result. So this is a way for us to determine these values as exact values. Our calculator is only going to spit back that number right there. I'll never spit back negative radical 3 over 2. Unless you spend like $300 and get a, a really, really nice calculator. Um, and this is the approach that we have to use in the reference angle. This here, that's that's what we use, right? The reference angle. We knew a lot of thing, a lot of information about that. Okay, it gives me this this triangle right here, and then I use the all sin state calculus to tell me whether it was plus or minus. So let's do this one. Um, we're cotangent of 495. Okay, now if it's 495, that's bigger than 360. So I'm going to ask the question: What is the cotangent of 495 minus 360? Okay. Well, if I take 495 minus 360, that gives me 135. So I'm interested in actually the cotangent of 135. Okay. Um, when I draw my theta of 135, so that angle right there is theta being 135. So theta bar, my reference angle, it's going to be 45 degrees. Okay. So now my question is, if I can ask the question, what is the cotangent of 45 degrees, I'm on the right track of being able to get, to get my answer here. Okay. Now, if it's 45 degrees, so let's think about a 45 degree angle. So that's 45 degrees. You've got a right triangle. Every 45, 45, 90 right triangle, that's N, that's N. And that's n radical 2, and that's all based off the Pythagorean theorem. Um, so if I do cotangent, cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent. So tangent, I remember tangent is equal to opposite over adjacent. So cotangent is adjacent divided by opposite. So adjacent divided by opposite would be n divided by n. So it just gives me 1. Okay. Now just be careful here because I want cotangent. And when I look at this device, all students take calculus. Sine is the only one that's positive over here. So all the other ones are negative. So cotangent of 135 is the same thing as cotangent of 45, but 135 should be negative and not positive. So cotangent of 135 is equal to negative 1. And again, if we ask this, now what, what's kind of a pain on the TIA384 is that there isn't a cotangent secant or cosecant button. So what we have to do is that hit, because they're, they're reciprocals, I go 1 divided by tangent of 495. That's saying cotangent of 495. We get that number right there. And that is, like I said, equivalent to um, 1 over tangent of 135. So Basically, it says cotangent of 495. This one says cotangent of 135. Are they equivalent? Are they the same? Absolutely. Um, and if I were to take 1 divided by tangent of 45, this should give me a 1, a positive 1. And you see then, well, if that gave me a positive 1, then i got to know what quadrant 135 was in, so I know to negate it. Um, with GeoGebra, it's nice to check because I can... Just type in cotangent of 495. And it spits back the negative 1. So I can type in those cotangent, cosecant, secant um, relationships. Uh, let's see here. Let's try some in gradients. 
Okay, so 16 pi root 3. So we want to find six, sine of 16 pi root 3. Um, now I know, like I said, it's easier to work in degrees, um, but 360 degrees is equal to 2 pi. Well, 2 pi, so it has this same denominator. I always like to do that. Whatever this denominator is of my, we call that the argument, uh, whatever uh, angle you're interested in here. The denominator of my argument is 3, so I'm going to take 2 pi and rewrite it. So denominator of 3. So you see then, obviously, that this 16 pi is more than one revolution around. So what we have, what happens here is if I go all the way around one time, that would be 6 pi over 3. That would be 12 pi over 3. Okay, and if I keep going, that would be 18 pi over 3. So I went too far with 18 pi over 3. So it's, it's less than uh, three revolutions around. Okay, so there's, uh, like I said, 6 pi over 3. 12 pi over 3, and this would be 15 pi over 3, okay? So to get 15 pi over 3 to 16 pi over 3, I need to go another, that's going to be pi over 3 radians. So there would be my terminating ray, okay? To find theta, theta there would be that blue um, angle that I just traced out. Theta bar would be that dotted angle. Okay, so theta bar would actually be that, and that is going to be pi over 3. Okay, um, alternatively, if you don't like it that way, like I said, you can take 16 pi over 3. If you have trouble working with these fractions, 16 pi over 3, you can do this. Okay, so it's going to cancel. It's going to cancel. Need 6 there, okay. Uh, so now I'm looking at uh, 16 times 60. Okay, so let's just kind of see what happens here. If we go 16 times 60, it gives me that. So 16 pi over 3, when I ask this question, it's the same thing as asking in degrees a sine of 960. But the sine of 960, we don't like that, so we subtract 360 from it because it's too big. Subtract 360, subtract 360 again, and I get 240. Okay, and that's nice. So sine of 240, so this picture right here, there would be 180, there would be 240. You kind of see that this ray is going to be in the same position as that ray. Well, if that's 240 degrees, if that is 240 degrees right there, hopefully it makes sense that that would have to be 60. 60 degrees in radians, pi over 3. Okay, So hopefully that, that explanation allows you to kind of make sure you understand that when you have angles that are bigger than 2 pi or angles that are bigger than 360, start reducing them so that they're smaller uh, than 2 pi or smaller than 360. Okay, So um, we know our theta bar is 60 degrees. Let's maybe approach that a different way if I'm talking about 16 pi over 3. Um, do it this way, Six, 16 pi over 3, and I'm just going to start subtracting multiples of 2 pi or revolutions or kind of like what we did in degrees, multiples of 360, until I get a number between 0 and 2 pi. So if I subtract 6 pi over 3, so you're going to be 10 pi over 3, still bigger than two, 6 pi over 3. I'll we'll subtract another 6 pi over 3, so it gives me, when I subtract that, it gives me 4 pi over 3. Well, that is 4 pi over 3 is less than 6 pi over 3, or 2 pi. So I know I'm under one revolution. If I know that this right here, let's just draw this picture. If I know that rotation is 3 pi over 3, then I need to go just a little bit further to get my 4 pi over 3. Okay, And if that's 4 pi over 3, then I know that this reference angle is pi over 3. Okay, So all that being said, when we deal with sine of 16 pi over 3, it's the same thing as asking what is the sine of 4 pi over 3, which is equivalent, if you want to, to think about asking the question sine of 240 if we're working in degrees. 
And some people prefer degrees. Some people see those radians right away and change everything to degrees, do all the work in degrees, get an answer in degrees, and then at the end, change it back to radians. That's fine. It works. It's time consuming, but it works. So now the question is, okay, if that's the case, if all students take calculus, if, if my reference angle theta was pi over 3, okay, which is a 60 degree angle, so pi over 3 is equivalent to 60 degrees, so that would be 60, 90, 30. Across from 60 is always n radical 3, across from 30 is n, and this is always 2n. If I'm asking sine, it's opposite over hypotenuse. I'm going to take n radical 3 over 2n, excuse me, radical 3 over 2. Okay, so sine of 16 pi over 3 is going to be whatever that ratio is right there. Um, it's like 0.866, something like that. But because I know it ends in the third quadrant, it's terminating in the third quadrant, tangent is the only thing positive in the third quadrant, this should be a negative radical 3 over 2. So when we type, now to check this, I'm going to go to mode, go down to radian, and I'm going to hit sine of 16 pi over 3, hit enter, it gives me that number right there. Is that negative radical 3 over 2? Okay. And just to prove my point, um, is that the same thing if I go, all right, so second, enter, get back to this. So if I subtracted 6 pi from that, that would have been 10 pi over 3. Gives me the same quantity. If I would have done another 6 pi over 3 removed from that, so 4 pi over 3, and this is the one I like to deal with because it's between 0 and 2 pi. It's, it's um, less than one complete revolution around that um, kind of coordinate plane around the, I guess, revolution around that uh, origin. Gives me that number right there. Okay. If we were in, you know how we did this, I change it to degrees. Okay, um, I think that ended up being, if I were to go back, see if I can do this. We would say it was, was it 960. 960 was, so 16 pi over 3 is 70 is 960. If I'm in degree mode, which I am, and go sine of 960, you see that should give me the same negative 0.86. Um, if I go sine of 960 minus 360 in there, so it would have been, what, 600? Gives me that. If I would have done maybe another 360 remove, so that would be uh, another way of saying 240 in there. It gives me that. So you see a sign of 240 is the same thing as sign of 4 pi over 3. Um, so that's kind of the way uh, that we use reference angles uh, in that fashion. Now, this one's a little bit different because this one's a negative. Okay. Uh, so this is saying secant of negative pi over 4. Negative pi over 4 just means that you're moving clockwise. So that would be my terminal ray. Well, how many radians do I need to go back up that way? So theta, okay, how many, how many radians need to get this ray to become the positive x-axis? It would be pi over 4. Okay, so everything I learned about pi over 4... I should know then uh, about negative pi or should tell me everything I need to know about negative pi over 4. Okay, so here's the thing. If I have a pi over 4 angle, so that's pi over 4. Pi over 4 is equivalent to, this is something we should know, it's 45 degrees. So this is n, n, n radical 2. So secant, that's the um, reciprocal of cosine. So secant is going to be, so cosine is... Uh, adjacent over hypotenuse, so secant is going to be hypotenuse over adjacent, so it's n radical 2 over n, so I should get radical 2 back. Okay, So secant of negative pi over 4 uh, should be a ratio of radical 2, but now we got to think about what quadrant it's in. It's all students take calculus. Cosine is the only one that's positive in the fourth quadrant. Secant is its reciprocal, so its reciprocal should be positive as well, so radical 2 is uh, that value. Uh, again, like I said, um, UTIA 384, if you're going to do secant, you got to go 1 divided by cosine. 
I'll just do it in, in GeoGebra real quick. If I just type in secant of negative pi over 4, you see you get that number right there, which is the same thing as the square root 2. So that's the purpose of your reference angles. Now, the only way that you're going to get good at these reference angles is practice, practice, practice. And there should be a lot of those in your web assignments. Um, draw pictures. Uh, be organized. Think things through. Whenever you see um, angles that are bigger than 360 degrees or bigger than 2 pi, and find a coterminal angle with them. Yeah, you can do the same thing here. Some people don't like dealing with a negative pi over 4. Uh, but what you can do is you can take a negative pi over 4, add to it uh, 2 pi, which would be 8 pi over 4, and 7 pi over 4. So then you can say, okay, well, 7 pi over 4 would be about right there. Oh, right there. And now the question is, well, how many degrees or how many radians in this case do I need to take that thing back up to become that axis? Your theta bar would be um, pi over 4, yeah. Okay, so you can do that. So the secant of 7 pi over 4 is equivalent to the secant of negative pi over 4. Just to prove that to you, you can check that again with these calculators. The secant of 7 pi over 4 should give me 1.41 back again. Anyways. Right, so that brings us to, I believe, the last idea here that I'm going to be really interested in and in talking about is the trigonometric identities. Um, so we've already talked about the reciprocal identities. Cosecant is 1 over sine. Secant is 1 over cosine. Cotan is 1 over tangent. We saw that with the K3 a minute ago, a while ago. Tangent is sine divided by cosine. Okay, sine divided by cosine. Because if you think about it, um, just kind of work things through here real quick. If I go um, sine, we said was sine of theta was y over r. Cosine of theta was x over r. And tangent of theta became um, y over x. Okay, well, if I take y over r divided by y over x, Okay. Y divided by R divided by Y divided by X. If I multiply by this reciprocal, okay, so I get X over Y. Uh, what am I doing here? Oh, I, I messed up. Sorry. Let me restart. I wrote the wrong one down. Okay, so y, let's do it this way, y divided by r, so I get the sine, y divided by r, and then I take cosine, which is x divided by r, and for some reason last one I write y over x. If I do that, they both have the same denominator, so I can just cancel and say I'm left with y over x, or I can actually multiply by r over x. That cancels with that, I multiply straight across, I get y over x. Well, what was this? y over r was sine. x over r was cosine. When I take sine divided by cosine, and I get this thing here, which is tangent. So that's where this kind of, we'll call this an identity. Tangent of theta is equal to sine of theta over cosine of theta. Uh, and then the reciprocal is true as well. What is this? What, what is an identity? An identity is an equation that is always true. 100% of the time, always true. So if I were to say, no matter what my input is, so if I were to take tangent of theta, so let's just say tangent of Let's say any number, I'm going to let it be A. And we'll create a slider here uh, for what A is. Okay, so in this, this here is the net tangent. Okay. Uh, if I were to take then sine of A divided by cosine of A. Okay, so here, this was tangent of A. And this here is sine of A divided by cosine of A. You see here, as I change A, those two numbers stay the same. Okay? I mean, no matter what my input is, this side is always equal to this. Um, so that's an identity. You've seen identities before. Um, you know, an algebraic identity would be like this. If I have 2 times x plus 3, 
that is equal to 2x plus 6. That's an identity. No matter what I put in for x here, the same x over here, I get a true statement. Um, these are your Pythagor what we call our Pythagorean identities. Um, they're simply saying that if you take sine and square it, add to it cosine squared, you should get 1. Sine squared plus cosine squared should equal 1. Um, tangent squared plus 1 equals secant squared. Uh, and 1 plus cotangent squared equals cosecant squared. Those are also additional identities. Uh, and when we talk about these, we'll talk about these in a little bit more detail when we get to... Uh, the unit circle approach uh, and where these things come from. Um, but right now, just try to commit these to memory. This one's the best one to remember um, because if I go sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, if I divide everything by sine squared, okay, sine squared divided by sine squared gives me 1. Cosine divided by sine, cosine divided by sine gives me cotangent. Okay. You see that right here, cosine divided by sine. Well, cos. So I've got to actually. I got cosine divided by sine times cosine divided by sine right here. When it's cosine squared divided by sine squared, so it's going to be cotangent squared, and one over sine. So one over sine squared is this, but one over sine is cosecant. So I really got cosecant times cosecant. Cosecant times cosecant is cosecant squared. So you see. If I start with this first identity of sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1 and divide everything by sine squared, it gives me this, which is that identity right there. If I were to divide everything by cosine squared, cosine squared, cosine squared, cosine squared, so sine divided by cosine, sine divided by cosine is tangent, so it's going to give me, obviously it's squared, so it's going to be tangent squared right there. Cosine squared divided by cosine squared is going to give me 1. And 1 divided by cosine, 1 divided by cosine right here is secant. So that's going to be secant squared. Um, so if you remember this one and then realize that if I divide by either that object or that object, it gives me these other two, that's going to be a way of uh, not having to memorize these other two. All right, so the question is, can we use these identities to kind of answer questions like this? Express sine theta in terms of cosine. When I say in terms of cosine, it means that's the only thing that is going to be left in my answer is cosine. So sine of theta in terms of cosine. Well, sine of theta in terms of cosine. How can we do that? Well, we want to come up with a identity out of this, this stuff up here that involves only sine and cosine. Um, so we've got that one. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to go sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to 1. And this is really a, a, a task in your algebra real well. I want to express sine theta in terms of cosine theta. That means solve for solve some equation for sine. So you have sine on the left hand side. And the only thing on the other side is cosine. So if I do this, sine squared theta, subtract cosine from both sides, so it gives me that. Now if I square root, square rooting, I get plus or minus. And I'll have 1 minus cosine squared theta. So this, I think it says express sine, sine of theta, in terms of cosine. So the only thing over here should be the cosine uh, function. Okay. So what's that allow me to do? Well, think about this. And I'll just do a, a simple one. It says that if I have sine of, let's say, 34 degrees. Kind of odd, maybe. Uh, measurement at okay, 34 degrees. They're saying that should be equivalent to the square root of 1 minus cosine of 34 degrees. Now, just the way I'm going to type this in. Cosine of 34 be squared. Put that off. Extreme is 6.56. Okay. Uh, if I would have used a different number, let's say I used 44. Here I'll use 44. Enter, enter. You 
FC gives me the same number there. Okay. Uh, so this is just another tool that expresses the sign, but not using essentially the sign. Um, the what, what I typed in there on your calculators, cosine squared theta is actually this cosine of theta, whatever that evaluates to be squared. Those two statements are equivalent. Okay. Um, this here, the reason for this is so that we don't write something like this. I write it that way. People think that the theta is what is getting squared, where it's actually the cosine of theta that needs to be squared. So to eliminate that ambiguity, if we want something that's this, if we want to say this, then we need to put the, we usually write the two, the power of two right there before the argument. Uh, this one here says express tangent in terms of sine. Tangent in terms of sine. So I'm going to try to find a tangent rule up here or identity uh, that um, deals with just sine. It says theta is in quadrant two, uh, so that's going to be useful as well. In a moment. Express tangent in terms of sine. Give me one second. I go. You hear this ruckus? My daughter playing with toys. So just give me one second. Okay. So this one's a little bit trickier. It says express tangent in terms of sine. Tangent in terms of sine. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to pull off that one right there. Because okay? I know that that deals with sine. Um, when, let me give myself a little bit more room here. Uh, if I say tangent of theta is equal to sine over cosine. Now that is, that is expressing tangent in terms of sine and cosine. I just want sine. Lila, Lila, shh, please, thank you. Um, so I need to get rid of this cosine. I need to rewrite it so that it's just showing sine. Well, it's just, it's, it's really a use of that right there, okay? Um, if I had sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta was equal to 1, I want to replace cosine here. So cosine squared theta is going to be 1 minus sine squared theta. So cosine of theta is equal to plus or minus 1 minus sine squared theta. Well, if I know that that is true, which the algebra proves that it is, I can now come over here, and where I see cosine theta, I can replace it. So sine theta over plus or minus 1 minus sine squared theta. And now what I've done is I've taken tangent, and I've rewritten it, so the only thing over here is sine. Okay, the only expression, only trig function we're seeing is sine. Now it says where theta is in its quadrant 2. Well, if I think about quadrant 2, all students take calculus. Sine is what, or sorry, tangent is what in quadrant 2? It's negative. So I need to have this quotient turn out to be negative. Well, sine in the second quadrant is positive. So that's going to be a positive number all the time. Well, in order to get tangent to be negative, as if that's going to always be positive, this one needs to be negative. So I need to take that negative version. So that is my answer. Now, let's kind of see how this kind of works out. And I think this is a, is a good idea to try um, to, to kind of grasp an idea of what's going on here. It says theta is in the second quadrant. I'm just choosing a number that's in the second quadrant. I know 98 degrees is in the second quadrant. I'll just evaluate tangent at 98 using that number right there. So that means that if I evaluate this at 98 degrees, it should give me the same negative 7.12 number. So I'm going to take sine 78 degrees divided by, now negative on the bottom, square root of 1 minus, that would be sine of 98 degrees, and now I'll square that. That parenthesis should be up. Okay, so that should be good. So that is typing in this thing right here. And if I do this correctly, I should get negative 7.12 back. I know. So what did I do wrong? So 98 degrees. 98. Oh, that was 98. And there we get that same number back. So now if I choose, so this, is, this should be accurate for no matter what number I choose in the second quadrant. So if I go 179 degrees, 
second quadrant gives me that number there. I should be able to go 179. 179. Enter. And the same thing. Uh, 135. Let's try that one. 135. Gives me negative one back. So this thing should give me negative one back as well. 135. So this is a way of expressing tangent so that you know it's in terms of sine. Uh, you guys have seen stuff like this, like if I had uh, 2x plus y equals 12, you've been asked to solve that for y in terms of x. So that would look like this. You solve for y, so that it's all by itself, so that's what I did. Solve for tangent, so it's all by itself. And on this side, the only thing that is present is the variable x. So on this side, the only thing that is present is the trig function sine. So that's kind of analogous phrasing of um, expressing something in terms of something else. Uh, these examples says if tangent of theta is 2 thirds and theta is in quadrant 3, find cosine of theta. Okay, so tangent... of theta is two-thirds, and theta is in quadrant three. So we're looking at this right here. I'm just going to draw a picture. That's theta. That would be my ray. So theta is two-thirds, and it's – sorry, sorry. I don't want to phrase it. Tangent of theta is in two-thirds. So that's theta. I don't know how big theta is. Okay. Um, but what I do know – this picture right here, okay. Um, obviously, that's going to be your reference angle, but it's saying tangent is equal to two thirds. Well, tangent is opposite over adjacent, so the opposite side would be two, and the side would be three. Okay. Now, understand that that's negative, and that's negative because we're in the third quadrant. And that hopefully makes sense to you, okay? Um, negative divided by negative should change to a positive. Uh, now, if I do that, if I go, this is my, uh, basically the way of maybe doing this, is to say this point here is located at negative 3, negative 2. But if I want to find my R value here, I'm going to take negative 2 squared plus negative 3 squared. I'll square root that, so there's 4, there's 9, so it's root 13. So R is root 13. So now I ask, once I've got these three components of this right triangle, I can now find cosine. Okay, so cosine of this theta is equal to adjacent divided by hypotenuse, so negative radical 3 over, or sorry, negative, I don't know why I put radical, it's negative 3 over root 13. And we like to rationalize that, so negative 3 radical 13 over 13. Uh, if they ask me to find the cosine, let's think about this, if they ask me to find the cosine, that's that. Let's say, let's say they ask me to find the sine of theta. The sine of theta would be opposite over hypotenuse, so negative 2 over root 13. Now let's see if this makes sense. Like that we know that if I square this, square that, add them together, I should get 1. That's what the uh, abbreviate or the above the uh, quadratic, or not quadratic, let's roll up. Pythagorean identity right here says sine squared, guys, sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. So, just kind of a way of checking myself, if I took negative 3, root 13, squared that, add to it, negative 2, root 13, squared that. Do I get 1? Well, negative 3 squared is 9, root 13 squared is 13, plus a negative 2 squared, 4, radical 13 squared is 13. Does that give me 1? 13 over 13, that equal, equates to 1. So I know that these, by, by finding essentially sine of theta, even though I was only asked for cosine, 
I find any sign of theta, I absolutely know that I've done the cosine correctly. Uh, example 7 here. If secant of theta equals 2 and theta is in quadrant 4, find the other five trigonometric functions of theta. All right. Well, secant, a couple ways of doing this. And when, when I see secant, guys, I don't like dealing with secant. Uh, when they tell me that, or cosecant or cotangent, when they tell me secant of theta is 2, they are at the exact same time telling me the cosine of theta is the reciprocal of 2, which is 1 half. They're telling me theta resides in the fourth quarter. So we're looking at something like this. Okay, so theta would be that angle. Now when I do this, I get this right triangle. I'm always going to draw up this right triangle here. Because remember, if I'm looking at this theta bar, then I know about that angle. It tells me everything I need to know about theta. So if I look at this, so this theta bar would have a secant of 2 or cosine of 1 half. So cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So the hypotenuse theory they're telling me is 2. The adjacent side is 1. So now I need to figure this out. Well, if I figure that out, I'm going to use the... Um, Bag right there, I'm going to say 1 squared plus whatever this is. Let's call that just, uh, I'll just call it, uh, let's just call it y. 1 squared plus y squared should equal 2 squared. So we should have y squared is equal to uh, 4 minus 1. So y is equal to radical 3. So this distance here is radical 3. Okay. 1 squared, and you can check this, 1 squared would be 1, radical 3 squared would be 3, 2 squared would be 4, 1 plus 3 equals 4. Okay, so that 3, though, that radical 3, it's a negative y value. It's going down. Okay, because um, we're in this, so we're in the fourth quarter. So that point right there um, would have an x value of... Uh, one in a y value of negative radical three. So I'm going to ask the other five trig functions. Okay, well, sine of theta, cosine of theta. I already got secant, uh, cosecant of theta, tangent of theta, and cotangent of theta are the things that we're looking for here. Um, All right, so the easy one, we already knew secant was 2, so cosine had to be 1 half. Uh, now, sine would be opposite over hypotenuse, so that's going to be negative radical 3 or 2. Now, sine and cosecant are reciprocal, so it's going to be 2 over radical 3. If I rationalize that, negative 2 radical 3 over 3, and that's what we like to do. We like to rationalize these. Uh, tangent, you can do tangent one of two ways. You can look at the picture and say oh, it's opposite over adjacent, so it's a negative radical 3. Or you can go use the identity and say tangent was the same thing as sine over cosine. I should have these datas in here. I forget them sometimes. If I know sine was negative radical 3 over 2, I know cosine was 1 half. Those cancel, leaves me negative radical 3 over 1, which is exactly what we get by we look at the picture. Cotangent is the reciprocal of this, so it would be negative 1 over radical 3. Rationalized, radical 3 over 3. Should be negative. So that's kind of what they're asking for when they want the, uh, the five other trigonometric functions of theta. Um, this here, uh, find the area of a triangle using sidelines A and B. Uh, this is essentially the law of sines or, or help uh, being able to find the, the area using the law of sines. Basically, what it does, if you know the included angle and the two sides that sandwich that, you can find the area of a triangle by taking one half that distance times that distance times the sine of that angle right there. Okay. Um, so I will let you. I don't know how many of these examples I gave you. I'm not going to work that through too much. I'm not going to really ask too many questions about this. Uh, and the videos are already long enough. So um, kind of right now, uh, put this on the back burner. Hopefully that helps. Um, I, I do anticipate a lot of questions on this. Um, if uh, if you do end up needing more examples, uh, please, do, especially when you're doing the web assignment assignments, now that I'm not there, uh, it would benefit you to look through 
some of these other videos here because these are these are the videos from last year. Uh, there might be some questions in there um, that can help you inside the homework. Um, I, I would anticipate having questions like right here. I, I think I, I pulled out some from WebAssign uh, that you might want to look at before you do that assignment. Same thing here. Um, let's see here. Maybe maybe watch this one. Uh, and then there's more examples down here of reference angles and examples. Um, I, I truly believe, guys, that it's going to be very, very useful for you to uh, see as many examples as possible. So opening those videos and doing the legwork within those videos is going to pay dividends uh, for the rest of the course. Uh, this kind of maybe shows you a, an animation of what your reference angles are, at least in degrees. You see here when we between 0 and 90, your reference angle is, I, I don't know, a way of getting a shot in um, GeoGebra, but it'd be kind of like that. So theta is 68 degrees, and that's the same thing as your reference angle. But when I get over here, now I can't call it theta bar. Uh, that notation is kind of uh, impossible, I guess, in, in GeoGebra, or I haven't figured out how to do it. Uh, so I just call it theta sub 1. So that's my reference angle. Uh, here's um, the angle of theta that I'm interested in. So you can see there that that additional 47 degrees is what I would need to take that red to become this green one. Um, you see that when I'm in the, when I terminate in the third quadrant, that theta, now here it's that theta sub 1, theta sub 2, but still it's our theta bar. Uh, so whenever I got this subscript on here, it's our theta bar. There you see it would be 54 degrees, and that can be found by taking 234 minus 180. And then over here, that purple one, theta 3, uh, that would be that remaining 56 degrees that I need to get that uh, terminating ray to become my positive x-axis. So that kind of gives you maybe the, the visual of trying to figure out what those reference angles are. Uh, but you notice the reference angle is always the terminating ray back to the x-axis. Okay, you might have to go up to the x-axis. So this like 70 or 65 degrees right there would be that ray or that angle that I just traced out to get back up there. Okay. Um, it's always back to the x-axis. So when we're here, being back to the x-axis would be moving up that way. Okay. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, again, please, 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 please uh, dedicate some time to, to these videos. Uh, I'm not going to make 5.3 due until... Um, Maybe Thursday evening right now. Thursday, let's go Thursday evening at, at, at midnight. Um, hopefully that gives you some time in class and outside class to watch this video along with some of the examples that are that are illustrated here in these um, these videos. Okay, so please, please, please watch those.